Let's open your Bible to Matthew 6. While you're looking there, I'd like to just read something from Luke 11 that corresponds with Matthew 6. It says, And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Jesus did a lot of amazing things. He was the most outstanding figure in history. I've just spent about the last three months just looking at Gethsemane. And the only thing I could do when I would come into the office every day was say, He's amazing. He's utterly amazing. He was amazing in everything that He did. He walked upon the water. He calmed seas. He raised the dead. He took on hell without even lifting a finger and defeated it. He was utterly amazing. But what I find amazing here is that His disciples never came to Him and asked this, Lord, teach us to, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to walk upon the water. Lord, teach us how to cast out demons. I mean, when I want to know something, for example, if, if I wanted to know how to become strong, I wouldn't go to a 90-pound weakling to find out how to be strong. I would go to a power lifter to find out how to be strong. If I wanted to know how to play basketball, I wouldn't look in the mirror. I'd go talk to Michael Jordan. I would pick out people who excelled in a certain area, and they would be the ones that I would draw my advice from. Well, looking at Jesus, knowing all the great things that He did, I would try to pick out the greatest thing He did, and that would be the thing I would ask Him to teach me. And isn't it amazing that what they asked Him to teach them was how to pray. No one prayed like He prayed. No one. No one prayed as Jesus prayed. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say this, would you please teach me to pray like you pray? Now let's go look at the prayer in, in greater extent in Matthew 6. He says in verse 9, Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here we see, first of all, the perfect psyche, the, per the perfect way to approach God in prayer, our Father. It is amazing that a teeming mass of rebels could be so redeemed that they could go before God, before whom the seraphim bow, and call Him Father. It's absolutely amazing. And so we can go before Him secure, in His strength, in His grace. And yet at the same time, the other side of that is acknowledging that our Father is in heaven. I remember a picture that was taken, I believe back in the 60s or possibly the 50s. Well, when, when John F. Kennedy was in office. And um, the picture is taken while he's seated there in his chair in the Oval Office behind his desk. And you can see through his desk. And there is his little child playing there underneath the opening of the desk. Here's the most powerful man in the world at the time. And yet, because this child is a son, he plays at his feet. So we have both of these things. We have this idea of, I go before my Father, always remembering that my Father is the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth. And so we have both a peace and a trembling. We have security and trembling. Someone asked me one time, what is it like to pray? Sometimes it's like a very, very peaceful, dark night with all the stars shining as you look out the window. Sometimes it's like a cool breeze blowing through the room. And sometimes it's like kneeling down three feet away from an F5 tornado. That's who he is. 
And sometimes you need to understand that the closer we draw to this God, the more wonderful and the more dangerous it becomes. Our Father who art in heaven. Now what is his first petition? Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? Hallowed be thy name. We could say this, separate be thy name. That is so powerful. We could say this, unique be your name. Now, that may not sound that great to you, but just think about it for a moment. Most people, when they think about God as being holy, they think God, it means God is sinless. Well, God is sinless, but that's not the primary mean of holiness. I think Burkhoff sets it forth really, really well when he talks about an ethical holiness and he talks about a majestic holiness. The word holy means to cut. And then cutting to be separate, to be unique, to be in a completely category, in a complete category of the other. What does it mean that God is holy? There is no one like God. It's not that he's like us, just bigger. He's not like us at all. All of us in creation fit neatly into a single category. God is not in that category. He's entirely other. And to treat God as holy is to recognize him to be in a category, a singular category, separated from all other things and higher, loftier and exalted. What does it mean when he says, hallowed be thy name? It was his desire that every creature in heaven and on earth would see God in that other category. That they would esteem God as God esteems himself. That they would place him there in their own hearts above absolutely everything else. No competing loyalties. Which is actually what blessed are the pure in heart means. Blessed are those who have no competing loyalties in their heart. Hallowed be thy name. I had a Greek professor who always said you have to look inward and outward in this text. You can't cry out, hallowed be thy name in all the world, unless first you cry out, hallowed be your name in me. And this is not just about rule keeping or commandment keeping. Or dressing like a Puritan. Or looking like you stepped out of a Pride and Prejudice movie. This is not about looking ancient. It's a matter of the heart. You may be the wildest man. You may be uncontrollable like the sea. You may do better in the woods than in a library. But if you have known Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead, if he has entered into your heart, then he becomes the controlling passion. And that is the key to holiness. Because I'll be very honest with you, to some degree, I guess you could say about me, I'm somewhat wild and profane. I don't care about religion. Don't like most of it. But there is Christ crucified and raised from the dead. And he is the one who controls the heart. Everything for him because of who he is, because of what he's done, because of what he will do. That controls us. That makes us want him and to seek him and to do his will and to be pleasing to him. To be holy. If you begin with morality, when you talk about holiness, it will always lead to legalism. But when you begin relationally, 
Who is this God? How holy and beautiful and glorious and worthy is he? How has he so won my heart? I hear in conferences like these all the time, you know, uh, son, give me your heart. When your child's heart has not the father won our hearts. And in winning our hearts, he controls the rest of us. What does it mean to be holy? It is to know more of who God is and what God has done for us in Christ. And that captivates our heart and drives us to love him. And then everything else falls in place. We don't look at how well we dot every I and cross every T. We only look at him. And our rule is love to God and love to men. Do everything for those two great loves. Now, when Jesus says, hallowed be thy name. In heaven, on earth. There's something that I want you to see. This is missional. I don't like to use that terminology, but it's a good term to use here. It should be your passion that in every place on this globe, men and women and children are separating God in their heart to love him, to serve him and to make him known. At Heart Cry, I guess our great motto is from Malachi 1.11, that his name be great among the nations. That his name be treated as holy, as distinct among the nations. You know, we talk about, as Brother Pollard mentioned, the electric cowboy. Someone that just doesn't do ministry anymore, just goes around and preaches in conferences. I think he was talking about me. I had shared that with him. Do you think that getting your name on a website or preaching in a conference means anything to God? It doesn't. This is just a tiny little world here. But there's a great big world outside of the homeschool community, outside of all our doors. And this is a time like no other in the history of the world. The nations are being moved right now. Europe will be changed in the next few months and has been changed in the next few months more than it was changed by World War II. And you can shake your head and say it's all bad. I look at a glorious opportunity to witness to people, to make the gospel known. What was the heart of our Lord? What drove him? It was this. He desired that the name of God be great among the nations. He desired that the nations would separate the name of Yahweh and set it in a category far above all other things. And you and I, no one's ever lived in a time like this. I see so many people violating the wisdom of Scripture, talking about the good old days. There have never been been better days to be alive. Never! With communication, with media, with travel, with the ability, as Dr. Beeky said, to publish, to make known. It's phenomenal the opportunity that has been given to us, yet we must work while it is day, for night cometh when no man works. I am not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I would not be surprised if I spend my last days in prison. But until the door is slammed, I must take this great op open door that has been given to me and the rest of the church. Look in history. There has never been a time like this. It's not a time for tight spirits and narrow minds, greedy hearts. It's a time for broad-shouldered men. It's a time for strong hearts. It's a time for risky men. 
It's a time to go forth in the name of our Lord and see that his name be made great among the nations. Dear brothers, I, I know a missionary. Brother Pollard knows him too. He's a Reformed Baptist missionary in Asia. Maybe one of the greatest missionaries alive today. And I don't say that lightly. If he came back here to the United States, and people have told him this, why do you not come back? If you came back to the United States, you would have such a platform. Your church would be gigantic. You're so godly. You're such a great expositor. Your knowledge of the world. And this is what he said. Why would I come back to a nation of what? 250, 300 million people? When I can work in a nation with 1.2 billion people. You see, we think somehow that if your name is known here, that then you're on the top of the list. That is absolutely absurd. Someone asked J.I. Packer one time, who's the greatest preacher alive? You know what J.I. Packer said? You don't know him. You don't know him. You don't know him. It's probably some little man preaching to six people in a hut. I'll conclude. There's a girl I know. She went home to be with the Lord. About two months ago. We called her Seti. And I can say where she was now because no one can touch her where she is now. She's in Indonesia. Born to a Muslim family. She came to know the Lord. Her parents imprisoned her. And then they decided to execute her. Her sister, even though she hated her for being converted, couldn't bear with the fact of having her sister killed by her parents. So she left the door open one night. She escaped. Then her mother fell into a coma. And so she actually came back to the family, knowing that she might be killed because she wanted to minister. She wanted to care for her mother. And so they basically enslaved her. And so she stayed there in the room with her mother who was in a coma and she was only allowed to eat what her mother vomited on the floor. And she lived that way for months. Finally, some believers I know were able to get in there, rescue her, sneak her out. Then she went with another young lady up to a village to preach the gospel there. And why did she go alone with another woman? Why was there a Deborah? Because there weren't any men courageous enough to go into that village. I went to visit her while she was working in that village. This is a village where you can be raped if you're a woman. If you're not a Muslim. And yet when I saw her walk out of her little cement or mud building she was living in, I noticed that there were some young teenagers, 19, 20, standing there on the sidewalk. And I thought, when she walks out, what's going to happen? And when she walked out, they greeted her and sort of bowed their head and treated her with honor. She walked by. She and the other workers said this, a lot of times when foreigners come here, they lie to people with regard to why, why they're here. And then sooner or later, the people find out why they're really here to preach the gospel. And they hate them. And they don't trust them because they're liars. We come into the village and we tell them that we are Christian. And they threaten us with our lives. They may beat us, pour urine and garbage on our heads, make our lives miserable. But if we can sustain, if we can continue walking with Christ, eventually we will win their honor. By the way we respond. No, no, friend. There's no great preachers here today. Not compared to that. I could stand here for the next 12 hours and just go down a list of little men and women who if they ate in your house and they were eating chicken, they just throw the bones on the floor. They wouldn't know any different. Of one preacher who saw a light in a missionary's house, saw a light and said, can I have one of those? And so the missionary gave him a light socket, a light bulb and a cord. Then the missionary went to visit that man a few weeks later. And the man said, the light and said, the light won't work. I hung it up just 
Well, there wasn't any electricity in the house. He just thought it would work. I mean, what a primitive little man who is worth more gold in glory than a thousand of me for his preaching and his stand for the gospel. I, I want you to realize something. Nothing, we, we don't live in a time where we can cloister ourselves. We don't live in a time where we should cloister ourselves. We should dwell with God. We should be with Him. We should study His Word. We should revel in the Gospel. But only with this great purpose of taking the Gospel in the world. Because I want you to know something. No one, no one, not the Apostles, not the Puritans, not the Reformers, no one has lived in an age like our age. No one. I was just discussing with the brothers here. There's a Muslim country. You wouldn't even believe it. And there is a reformed publisher there who has gotten permission to publish. All the things that are going on are astounding. Right now, we could use a bunch of really, really strong young men to go over in those refugee camps around the world and preach the gospel. There are doors opening up everywhere. Everywhere. Last thing I'd like to say is this. Please understand my heart. I'm just going to say it straight up. I want to talk to the young men. One of the things that I think has happened in the homeschool movement, and I homeschool, and I promote homeschooling, but young men, we've raised up a bunch of boys who buy adventure clothing out of a catalog, dream about swords and dragons and riding horses, buy toys and read books, but they're soft. Men, you may talk about homeschooling. You're a homeschool dad. Are you a homeschool dad or are you just married to a homeschool mom? And have your boys let me ask you a question, because in public school, people will always say this. Well, I don't send my boys to public school. One of the reasons I don't want them to be raised by women. Yeah, but are your boys being raised by a woman? Or are they being raised by a man? Can they do calligraphy? My question is, can they fight? There's a world out there and it's it's ugly and it's bad and it hurts. And it's wicked. And you've got to be tough as nails. And we need young men who are going to have wounded knees. And calluses also on their hands. Who are not going to play adventurer. They don't want adventure. They just want to go somewhere and die for Christ. Men, get more involved in raising your boys. Men, get more involved in making them men. And you're not going to, again, make them men by dressing them up in an adventure suit. Or just putting boots on their feet. Or putting some silly plastic sword in their hand. Let them be raised around men. Act like a man. Teach them to be men. Teach them to be soldiers. Teach them to take this opportunity. To go out and do these things that in many ways around the world, women are doing because there are not any men brave enough to do it. This is the time to have this same passion of our Lord. How do you interpret the Lord's Prayer? I interpret it this way. Lord. Heal me, prosper me, give me a life of ease, if by doing so, your name will be hallowed in the greatest way, your kingdom will come in the greatest way, and your will will be done in the greatest way. Or Lord, crush me, break me, grind me like powder, leave me sick. Throw me in a dungeon. Make my life a living hell. If through that, your name will be hollowed in a greater way. 
Your kingdom will come in a greater way and your will will be done in a greater way because that is all that matters. When everything comes to an end, it is all about his name being great, not only among the nations, but in the heavens.